Today is Friday, October 4th, 2019. Coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, a complaint has been filed against Texas Judge Tammy Kemp for the hug she gave Amber Geiger after she was sentenced to 10 years in prison for the death of Botham John. We'll give you the details. Remember juvenile judge Tracy Hunter, who fainted in court when she was sent to jail? Well, she is about to be released. Folks in Cincinnati are still angry about her particular case. Also, do educators need a special way to educate black boys? We'll talk about it with an educator at a school for boys. Also, got an update for you. In the Maryland HBC UK, seems the black lieutenant governor of Maryland none too happy with me after I called out his boss, Governor Larry Hogan, last night at the Capital Region National Minority Supply Development Council when it comes to funding of those HBCUs. He even told me, I know what the hell I was talking about, saying, have you read the judge's ruling? Yes, I have it right here. I shall unpack it for you. And also, we'll talk about uh, more civil rights organizations signing on to Byron Allen's case against Comcast that will go before the Supreme Court in November. Comedian Alicia Cooper is here with her take on the new events of the day. And finally, remember the great Diane Carroll, who passed away today at the age of 84. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. All right, folks, are still startled with the Dallas judge, Tammy Kemp, who came off the bench to hug Amber Geiger after she was sentenced to 10 years in prison for killing Botham Jean. The Freedom From Religion Foundation has now filed a complaint against Kemp with the Texas State Commission on Judicial Conduct, the agency that investigates allegations of judicial misconduct. The group said Kemp went too far. Kemp has also been criticized by activists who wonder whether a black defendant would get the same treatment. Now, two of the jurors in the case were interviewed by ABC's Good Morning America, and this is what they had to say about their decision to sentence Amber Geiger to 10 years in prison. There was a lot of crying. A lot of crying. When we were told to go decide between five and life, that was like, we didn't have words. Prosecutors were asking for 28 years. They were. Um, you all landed at 10. After hearing about how his family talked about him, he seemed like just the light in their lives and he was kind and just forgiving. caring and forgiving and I, I said I told everyone I was like I'm really having a hard time with this because we all agree that it was a mistake and I don't think I, th I don't think Bo would want to take harsh vengeance I think he would want to forgive her and I felt I didn't feel like I had any right to speak for him and he isn't there to talk for himself but listening to how people talked about him, I felt like he would forgive her. They asked for 28 years, and I'm going to be honest and, and true. I was like, I can't give her 28 years. I know a lot of people are not happy about the 10 years, but I felt like, you know, for this case was not like any other case. You can't compare this case to any of those other officers killing unarmed black men. Those officers that killed unarmed black men, when they got out, they went back to living their lives. Amber Geiger, ever since she killed that man, she has not been the same. She showed remorse in that she's going to have to deal with that for the rest of her life. Can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? We found out this morning about what his brother did, and it kind of it kind of helped us. I uh, feel like we ended up with the right decision. So one thing that Botham can teach us all is that we should all love each other instead of hate each other. And I, and I honestly think that if Botham would have just got shot and not killed, I think he would have forgiven Amber Geiger. But he didn't just get shot. 
he's dead. Like, never to come back again. And then talk about the remorse of Amber Geiger. Hell yeah. If your ass is facing up to 99 years in prison, you're going to try to show as much remorse as possible. It's still called consequences, folks. My panel, Chris Prudhomme, Republican strategist, Dr. Neon Bay Carter, Howard University Department of Political Science. Uh, folks, um, I, to, to hear the sister say, I couldn't give her 28 years. Yeah. A guy is dead right. because she wasn't paying attention and entered his apartment mm -hmm. while he was eating ice cream. Yeah. She's a police officer. Yeah. And I think, I think that part of it, too, is just in this whole conversation, Botham John and, and, and what happened is getting lost. It's now about Amber It's Geiger. all about her. And it's like, this Not man, the dead man. Exactly. Her. It's about her. And I think the thing is, I mean, like you said, anybody would feel remorse when you're talking about, I can go to prison anywhere from 5 to 99 years. But the fact of the matter is, you had the weapon. You were the responsible party. That gentleman didn't do anything, right, other than be in his own home, and you killed him. And the idea that, well, she's sorry, I want them to keep that same energy for every other person that comes in that courtroom under similar circumstances, charged with murder, saying they're sorry and they feel bad. Because there are plenty of people who feel sorry and feel bad and are not getting 10 years for the murder of another human being. I, I, I just... I, I... In this whole deal about, well, he just wants us to love everybody, let me be real clear. clear. As a Christian, I can love you while you're sitting your behind in jail. Right. I mean, I, I can have compassion for you, but there's a consequence. She took a life. And this idea of forgiveness without any kind of act of contrition, nothing to atone, it's just, I'm sorry, and then we forgive you, I feel like that's a really bastardized version of what forgiveness is. I mean, it's an action, and it takes time. And I'm not saying that this family doesn't feel that already. They can do whatever they want. But the way that this has been turned into, well, see, this is what Botham would want. We don't actually know what he would want. Right. He's dead. Now, his family may know best, of course, because they're the ones who are really dealing with this in ways that the rest of us are not. But I think the thing that's really insulting is that it cheapens forgiveness. It's just a thing that you just give people freely. Hey, maybe that's what some people feel, but holding that up as the model for what folks are supposed to do, and I think more importantly, what black people are supposed to do. You can slap us, you can punch us, you can kill us, you can beat us, and we're just supposed to say, we're sorry. I mean, we saw also the Charleston, and I think about this with uh, Eric Garner's widow, when she said she didn't want his damn forgiveness, right? He could go to hell with that forgiveness because her husband was dead, and people said, oh, that was so, so horrible. She wasn't gracious, but anger... And, 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 and rage are also legitimate emotions that mm -hmm. black people are not allowed to feel. I mean, can we go through that and some of that, right. too, on the way to that forgiveness? But, but, but in regards to what the jurors said, it was actually kind of frustrating to me because it was almost... She was almost placing Amber as the victim and, and not not Bo. Right. And it's, it's, it's very, very disappointing. I think it's... Especially in this day and age that we're in society, I think it sets a standard and a tone to kind of how, how things are. And the fact that he was... As his mom obviously expressed outrage, uh, uh, you know, differently than the brother, but, I mean, he was, like she said, he was sitting there innocently in, in his his own domain, his sanctuary, eating ice cream, relaxed, not a threat to her at all. Even if she, wa even when she walked in, he wasn't a threat to her. E even if it was, even if it was not uh, his place. The reality is that he was not a threat, just sitting there eating ice cream, doing what he, what he was doing. And the fact that all the blame has been well, he's been placed at, she's been placed as kind of as a victim. I think it's a real problem in society. I think people look at the number 10, but the reality is that she probably will be doing four or five years and she'll be out. Right. If not sooner, never know. I, I, just, I just think that, again, um, when, when we discuss this now for two days, mm -hmm. uh, there is this expectation that black folks are to forgive. Mm -hmm. And I made the point. It's been 18 years since 9-11. White folks have not mm -hmm. forgiven anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, there is revenge. There is justice. There is, and, and that, that, that always exists. And, and the thing here is, right, the, the mother made it clear that we are taught to forgive as Christians, but there are consequences to your actions. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the key there. So, so the issue is not the brother hugging. The issue is not even really what the judge did. It is you get 10 years in prison, you're a police officer. I have an expectation that as a cop, you are to operate at a much higher level mm -hmm. and a much uh, higher care when it comes to 
handling of a gun. So I'm going to hold you to a higher standard. Absolutely. Statement. But and I do think for Judge Kemp it is an issue because I don't know of any case where a judge comes and hugs a defendant. I've never seen it. I think it, 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 it ruins this idea of impartiality. Like, why is this woman worthy of a hug? You're, you're directing her to a Bible verse. You're giving her your personal Bible. It's like, keep that same energy for every defendant that comes in that courtroom. For every person you see, Amber Geiger shouldn't be a one-off. If this is truly how you feel and this is how you live in your practice of your Christianity and your, your faith, do that for every person that comes through that door. I don't know that you expen extend that kind of grace to anybody. So I do actually think it's an issue for the judge and more so for the judge than Botham John's family. They do what they want to do. They're private citizens, right? And they're processing a loss. You are a judge. And it should never be the case that it looks like any defendant is getting preferential treatment, much less a police officer, like you said, who have a responsibility for our health and safety every day, which is a responsibility that most people don't carry. And we also don't carry guns on a day-to-day -day basis right. either. And, and Roland, to, to your point earlier, uh, what, what the young lady in the jury was, the jury was saying is that she's, he's not, he is not shot. He's dead. He's gone. To never, ever return. And I think the thing that really, really bothers me, is, I think is a huge concern should be for all of us, is that I think it somewhat, in a sense, indirectly, civilly kind of sets a standard and kind of a template for other law enforcement. Like, oh, so, shoot, I'm so sorry. It was an accident type thing. And it's like, oh, well... So now that's the bar now. To so say, oh, okay, well, we know it's an accident, but... Oh, my bad. Yeah. Right. But like you said, it's a, it has to be a higher standard. You are, you're beyond trained in, uh, than someone who's uh, a licensed to carry a weapon. You're a law enforcement officer. Absolutely. They didn't have this for that officer in Minnesota when he killed that white woman. Yeah. Oh, and, and first of all, I see nobody to come off the uh, uh, stand with their Bible saying, so, uh, let's, let's, let, let's hold him and pray let's for be him friends. and right. find Jesus. I'm just saying. All right, y'all going to go to a break right now. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Maryland HBCU case, uh, which is, um, of course, uh, up, up, coming up against a deadline where the governor needs to actually make a much better deal. We'll also talk about how to educate uh, our black boys. And so all that coming up next, Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to check out Roller Martin Unfiltered? YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it. All right, folks, you've heard me talk a lot about MarijuanaStock.org. Why? Because they want to keep you informed of investment opportunities that make sense. We've all watched the growth of the cannabis industry. A recent report by New Frontier Data estimates the global cannabis market at over $340 billion. Now, we know that marijuana legalization is sweeping the country state by state. We also know that marijuana has a good cousin, the hemp plant, with a much higher concentration of CBD. That means hemp gives you all the medical benefits of marijuana without getting you high. Until recently, hemp farming was practically legal in the U.S. and heavily regulated by the DEA. However, the 2018 Farm Bill changed all of that, making it legal to grow hemp CBD in the U.S., thus creating one of the largest commodities worldwide. Very simple, folks. They need land to grow all of the plants, and that's where the folks at 420 Real Estate come in. Their business model is simple. They buy land that supports hemp CBD grow operations and lease it to licensed, high-paying tenants. That's right. They are hemp CBD landlords, and you can get in on the action. Now, what 420 Real Estate has done is uh, grant a special to the folks who watch Roland Martin Unfiltered. Originally, the minimum investment level for this crowdfunding campaign was 500 bucks, but they've lowered it to $200. That's right, $200 up to $10,000. Now, again, let me recap. This is a $340 billion industry that is still growing. You can participate with as little as 200 bucks. All you got to do to invest is go to MarijuanaStock.org. It's MarijuanaStock.org. You want to get in the game and get in the game now. And many of you know that I am a huge supporter of charter schools, school choice, parental choice, whatever you want to call it. And wh why is that the case? Because I do not believe there's only one way to educate a child. Uh, of course, I uh, created the initiative School Choice is the Black Choice because I'm just not interested in waiting for somebody else to figure out how they should educate black folks. I believe that we should take control of our own destiny, and that is running charter schools, being in control of the curriculum, being in control of the finances, which means controlling the education of our children. Uh, next week, I'm going to be in Denver uh, for a town hall uh, taking place at the Potter's House, Denver, uh, and that's going to be taking place on Friday evening. We'll be live streaming that event as well, and it's taking this conversation there. 
And I'm saying that again because uh, what I'm sick and tired of hearing is back and forth, this whole drama of the teachers union versus privatization, white folks trying to take money. The reality is this, black children, Hispanic children now make up a majority of those who are in uh, public schools, which means that while white folks are taking their kids and going to private school and they're to put them in parochial school and going elsewhere, these public schools is where we are. And so what are we supposed to do? We also know when it comes to the school system how they treat black boys and how oftentimes they get lost in the system, especially those who have specific needs. So what is the key to educating black boys? You keep hearing people say, oh, man, it's just so hard. My next guest actually says, mm, we also know how to do it. It's called putting in the work. Sean Hartnett, founder and executive director of Statesman College Preparatory Academy for boys here in Washington, D.C. How you doing, Doc? Uh, doing fine. Thank you. So here's what I find to be, um, what I find to be interesting is that when we had our conversation during the Congressional Black Caucus, and it, it, was, it was very interesting to me uh, to hear the pushback of folks when you were talking about the school and when you were saying, wait a minute, hold up. I have taken the exact same young boys that the traditional system had where they couldn't learn. Mm -hmm. They come to your school and they can learn. Mm -hmm. Yet folks say, you shouldn't do what you do. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it is mind boggling because folks don't want the idea of you controlling the school because it's not according to the system that they're used to. Mm -hmm. I, there's not much I can say about what you just said. I think it's very difficult um, to be in a space where you are trying to do really, really, really good work for a group of kids who need it more than anybody else, and you get any pushback, any pushback at all. And so when you are sitting in a space where people are coming at you from every direction, um, and you can't figure out why you why we wouldn't want the group of gentlemen who we all say needs a lot of help to get that help, I don't understand it. And and what was interesting to me when we, we had this conversation, when you said y'all kid y'all kids y'all blowing my phone up mm -hmm. trying to come to my school, which mm -hmm. which says that clearly they're not getting something here. Mm -hmm. what, what is it? I mean, what is the difference between what you were able to do? than what's happening in traditional schools to be able to get these young black boys to excel? You know, I learned a, a couple of things um, doing this work that, that I've, I've just been profoundly impacted by, and that was because we did something unique in opening the school. We went and talked to black boys. We went and talked to black boys, um, black and brown boys, um, 450 of them across the nation at a bunch of different schools all over, um, age, you know, gra grade three and up, talking to a second grader, it's, it's hard to get them to get past the, any, the excitement of lunch, you know, in PE. <laughs> but when you start talking to kids who are a little bit older in age, it's just amazing that they will tell you what they are experiencing. They will tell you why things are going well, and they will tell you why things are not. And after 450 conversations asking these young men the exact same questions, I learned a few things. Um, one, I, I don't think anybody will find a surprise. Relationships matter. Relationships matter. Um, how these young men, we pushed them hard to describe what is it in, that, that makes you feel like you're in a relationship with um, a teacher. Um, and they gave us more information than, than perhaps we were ready for. But they want to be in classrooms where their teachers are in control of the classroom. They want to be in classrooms where their teachers know exactly who they are, love them for exactly who they are. And what I kept finding was that these young men were saying, if you love me, then I will do your math. Right. I've never met a, a, an 11th grader, 12th grader, 4th grader who loves math the way an adult would love math, right? But they love their teacher. And if I love you, then I will do your stuff. Um, so they kept saying that there's this trading system that boys just kind of live with. If you like me, I'll do your stuff. Whatever it is you got to... And, I mean, the amazing thing of watching a boy who's had an A in science, an A in science, an A in science, an F in science, an A in science, an A in science, and yes, well, what happened for the F? Well, that teacher didn't like me. So you decided to get an F in a subject that you've done well in all these years? Absolutely. If, the, if a young boy... All of us know this to be true. If a boy loves his teacher, he'll go through the wall for her go through the wall. And if they don't like that teacher, or if they think the teacher doesn't like them, they will do nothing for that teacher. And so relationships stand out front 
more than anything else, how we build, maintain, and leverage those relationships for boys, black and brown boys from inner city environments, may be slightly nuanced than what you might do in other places, but the relationship is first. Um, second to that, you really do have to get into some excitement for them. They, they, they want to have experiences that are outside of what they normally experience. They want to be challenged. These young men want to be challenged. They love it when I walk into class and say, I got an absolutely nasty question, right? It's going to make your brain burst, right? And they're like, yes, give it to me. Um, and they struggle with it, but they want that to happen in a place where they feel safe, um, and where they feel loved and where they feel known. How many and students do you have? We have, we, we had 65 or 60 last year. We have 130 this year. So we more than doubled. And the makeup of your teachers? Um, my teachers, 75% of them are African-American males. We increased the number of females this year. So we do have several female teachers in the building. Um, largely all black. I, I, when you made that point, uh, uh, this is what Senator Kamala Harris said at the debate at Texas Southern University about the importance of black teachers. Uh, guys, go ahead and play that. My first grade teacher, Mrs. Frances Wilson, God rest her soul, attended my law school graduation. I think most of us would say that we are not where we are without the teachers who believed in us. I have offered in this campaign a proposal to deal with this, which will be the first in the nation federal investment in closing the teacher pay gap, which is $13,500 a year. Because right now in our public schools, our teachers, 94% of them are coming out of their own pocket to help pay for school supplies. And that is wrong. I also want to talk about where we are here at TSU and what it means in terms of HBCUs. I have, as part of my proposal, that we will put $2 trillion into investing in our HBCUs for teachers because, 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 one, as a proud graduate of a historically black college and university, I will say, I will say that it is our HBCUs that disproportionately produce teachers and those who serve in these many professions. But Thank also, you, Senator. But this is a critical point. If a black child has a black teacher before the end of third grade, they are 13% more likely to go to college. <laughs> if that child has had two black teachers before the end of third grade, they are 32% more likely to go to college. So when we talk about investing in our public education system, it is at the source of so much. When we fix it, that will fix so many other things. We must invest in the Thank potential you, of our children. Senator Sanders, and I strongly Senator believe you can judge a society based on how it treats its children, and we are Thank failing. You, on that, what you're talking about, that's what she's talking about, the impact of that specific teacher. And they're seeing black men teach, which is, and, 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 and I think if any of us think back to when we were in school, especially being a brother, you respond differently to a black male teacher than you do anybody else. Absolutely. And I think that I don't, I still struggle today with how people struggle with that as a reality, that these young men in particular are growing up environments where they are um, in need of that male role model and that male figure, and we are giving them that. Um, but not only that, we are working with these men who come into the building to do this work with these, with, with these young men to make sure that they are right, that they are investing in themselves and taking care of themselves. Our, our teachers literally, Fridays and uh, Thursday and Friday, half the day, we have therapists in the building for the adults, not for the children, to make sure that we are right when we are doing this work in front of them. Because if you are like me and you come from a background like mine, then there is a chance you can bring some of that into the classroom. And when the kids bring what they're bringing into if nobody's dealing with all of that as a reality, and we're going to all clash that into math, that's going to be a difficult subject. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 just, I was resonating with this because I did have black teachers. I had black women teachers, um, and I still remember them. Miss Chase was my fourth grade teacher, and that is so important. But how do you, you know, manage or balance the sort of academic with the emotional? Because, I, I mean, it's an emotional time mm -hmm. for young people. Mm -hmm. And then with some, like I said, some of the background issues, how do you manage that? And also, how do you make sure that the teachers and the the faculty and mm -hmm. other staff don't get burned out because mm -hmm. I can imagine some of these are hard hard issues mm -hmm. um, that come into that building sometimes that you guys have to confront as really first responders mm -hmm. for for these kids mm -hmm. you would you you would you are right on my street <laughs> um, there there is definitely a reality the fact that when you make the decision that you are going to serve black and brown boys who come from urban environments you are with that deciding that you're going to take on some more uh, 
maybe an additional level of trauma. Um, a third of the students in our students are students with an IEP. They're, they're students with a disability. That is significantly higher than most schools across the city, across the state, across the nation. Um, these young men are coming at, in at more than 50% at risk. We knew that when we decided we would serve this population that we would be taking on more than other schools decide to take on. And so we have tr decided to do some things differently than they do in other schools. We say all the time, we're not the other school. And so we spend quite a bit of time doing adaptive work with the teachers who are in front of our kids. You've got to spend time. It, it is a focus beyond any focus we've seen in any other school where we are really using therapeutic practice as a part of PD all the time mm -hmm. and having people come in to provide you know um, professional development and and therapeutic support to teachers not to kids we're literally putting because a happy teacher makes a happy classroom mm -hmm. and so if we can support these adults who are oftentimes bringing in a lot more from their own lives because they're coming from backgrounds where they're carrying a lot themselves if we don't help folks get in the room and say all of what you're carrying with all of what they're carrying inside this classroom that could go bad mm -hmm. or that could go good we are an extremely resilient people mm -hmm. Um, and we want to take that resilience and direct it towards outcomes for these young people. Mm -hmm. And so we've been very deliberate about that, saying we know what we're going to put you in front of, and so we want to support you as much as possible. Our folks uh, overwhelmingly say this is the best place they've ever worked. Mm -hmm. And it's also some of the hardest work they've ever done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those two things don't usually sit in the same job. Right. Well, I, I think it's important. Something that you said kind of kind of stuck with me is that I think having a therapist is really important because you can't take the issues at home and mm -hmm. bring them to the school. Uh, and I think more importantly is that, especially me growing up and obviously being younger, and I, I think it is so important because there's a lot of issues that we face at, you know, being African American young at home, mm -hmm. right, are, are, are just in, in, in life, being young, whether it be bullied or being, you know, the things of life as you have to, as a young kid. And I think being able to have a black male teacher that can empathize and that can understand mm -hmm. everything from your situation at home to uh, m maybe you have a father at home, uh, you know, with issues at the mm -hmm. house, whatever the case may be, they will to understand. I think they can appreciate that and empathize mm -hmm. more than having a white male or f white female teacher. But, but the other issue you have is that by, by being, being charter school, you make those decisions. Absolutely. And that's the difference. And, I, and, Absolutely. See, and see, we can sit here and dance around it, but the reality is, you are the one. As, mm -hmm. as a leader of the school, mm -hmm. you're saying, based upon my study, my curriculum, all things I've gone through, I know what's best. And so that's why I keep trying to explain to people mm -hmm. where I say, look, if there's a traditional school that's working, I'm down with it. Cool. Mm -hmm. But if it's not working, mm -hmm. I ain't down with it. Mm -hmm. if there's a charter school that's not working, I'm like, get rid of it. Mm -hmm. But you have the flexibility to craft a curriculum, mm -hmm. A, a workforce and those things that go along with it, and that's the difference between having school or parental choice than being forced to only have one system. And I think that's, I think it's so important that you um, highlight the power of autonomy and, and flexibility. Um, if one of my teachers came to me with some crazy idea the other day about something he wanted to do, I was at the store, got it, and brought the stuff into the building. He was playing with it the next day. Now, hold up, now, hold up. Now, here's the people I need people to understand. <laughs> no, people don't understand this. When we did my show, we did Roller Martin Unfiltered from, uh, actually, it was, it was my TV One show, from my high school in Houston, Jack Hayes High School. First, um, we could not mm -hmm. live stream using one system because in the district, mm -hmm. you could only use mm -hmm. this one unit mm -hmm. to stream out. The unit cost five thousand dollars. The streaming box that we had is four ninety nine. So they had to go through all kind of stuff to go around the firewalls and everything. But the but, but the reality is, they have vendors where if you want something, oh, you got to order from this vendor, and it's actually a massive markup. And you're going, wait a minute, why is this TV eighteen hundred when I can get one mm -hmm. for four ninety nine at Walmart? Absolutely. And so you see costs go up. Absolutely. All those skyrocket. Absolutely. And that's the difference. You would have had to wait maybe four to six weeks. Who knows? Or longer. Or no. To go through this acquisition or process. Or very simply, it's not a part of the curriculum that we purchase. It's not a part of the curriculum that we are um, promulgating as a, as, a, as a district. And so, no, you can't do that. 
the next day he was playing with it, trying to figure out whether or not he, he could make this work, what he would need to do to it in order to get the kids excited about it. It was a blast, right? And so that level of flexibility and autonomy, and let's not forget, I am sitting over a $3.8 million budget this year, making decisions about who gets contracts and who doesn't, right? Working within the community, finding people within the community to do this work, spreading some of that. Schools, we, th there's money in this. This is, this is, there's tons of money in this. And I'm making s decisions that are supporting. I've hired two parents who now work in the building, right? Who put their kids in the school, fell so in love with the school, they applied for every job until they got one, right? And so that's the kind of impact. When we talk about a community school, we're in a community bringing people from the community in. We're also employing people in the community. We're working contracts. We have a floor that needs to be replaced crazy set of like circumstances around how they were going to get it done. And I'm like, can I just call somebody? We called three people. They're like, oh yeah, we, we can do that. I can work black female owned businesses, black owned businesses to bring them in to do, um, to make some of this money as well. And I think that that's a, a significant part of why it's important that we be a part of the leadership of these schools as well. That's what I keep laying out. But most importantly, those black boys are now learning mm -hmm. Where before they're getting something they weren't they were get failing. Before. They're getting something they weren't getting before. And I'll tell you the story and to keep it short. Parent called me and said, "I want to do something for you. Go out in the community and do something for you." And I'm like, "Well, it's not that. No, no, no. I want you to understand." I took. She took her son to a movie, the Fast and Furious new movie that came out. And she said, "I'm sitting there with my son, enjoying the time with him, watching this movie. We shouldn't be watching. These cars are on the edge. They're speeding by, going on the edge." And she said, "I had this sudden moment where I realized that me and my son were there last year." We were going over the edge. We were on the edge speeding real fast, and then statesmen dropped into our lives. And now I'm at a movie enjoying time with my son. And I want to thank you for that. This is different. And this is not, it's important to say, this was not one of my parents who has a lot of need. This is a parent who was doing okay. But you went through a divorce, son going all kinds of crazy because dad is now out of the home. You're trying to figure out how you do it, balance work and manage a family and you need help. And we landed there, we created a relationship where the son isn't getting as much trouble, she's not getting calls every day, he's not getting suspended, son's doing work, he comes home every day and talks about school. She's like, this kid has never talked about school. <laughs> what are you all doing? Well, I don't care, keep doing it. We don't want anything to get in the way of a school that's doing that for a family. And not, that's one story. That's, you aggregate that to all of the kids who are in our, in our 70% of our families will tell you a story like that tomorrow. And that's why I say, so if you're traditional over here and you're not cutting the job, doing the job, and you over here are, I, want, I don't want you having 100. I want to see 400, 500, because if that... I disagree with you. Well, keep it small. <laughs> no, I want to no, manage no. it. No, 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 no. no. I, I, forget that. I want to see 1,000 and 2,000 because we have to be able to also create scale and then begin to replicate that mm -hmm. because you got to save as many as possible. And, and I think people don't understand that those formative years, mm -hmm. those first K through five are the formative years and studies don't lie. If they don't get it in those years, mm -hmm. you're playing catch up for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, and, that, and that's frankly a death sentence for many, many of our kids. So mm -hmm. uh, keep it up. We certainly appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right, folks, got to go to a break. We come back, we're going to talk about Maryland HBCUs. The Republican go Lieutenant Governor wasn't too happy with me because I called out his boss last night at the Capital Region National Minority Supply Development Council. He even told me I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. You sure? Next, Roller Martin Unfiltered. You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. November 7th through the 11th, the Life Lux Jazz Experience is going to be phenomenal, folks, taking place in 
uh, Cabo, November 7th through the 11th, uh, of course, uh, at the Day Club Los Cabos. It's going to be an amazing time. You're talking about, of course, golf and spa and wellness and, of course, uh, unbelievable concerts. The second annual Life, Lu Life Lux Jazz Experience will feature folks such as Mark Curry, Joel Albright, Alex Bunyan, Raul Madan, uh, Incognito, Pieces of a Dream, Kirk Whalem, Average White Band, Donna McClurkin, and Shalaya, Roy Ayers, and Ronnie Laws and Ernest Quarles. For Tom Brown as well. Folks, it's going to be amazing. So if you want packages, go to lifeluxjazz.com, L I F E L U X C J A Z Z.com. Or if you want to watch a live stream, that's right. We have a live stream there, folks. Uh, it's very simple. You go to gfntv.com, gfntv.com. The live stream pass will cost you $10.99. And so uh, they're selling those packages between now through October. 30th. And so if you can't make it uh, there, but you want to experience everything there, you can do so with this pass. I'll be broadcasting Roller Martin Unfiltered that Thursday and Friday from uh, the uh, Life Lux Jazz Experience. But again, if you want to experience it, all you got to do is get your live streaming pass, folks, which will cover all three days of all the concerts taking place there. $10.99. So go to gfntv.com, gfntv.com. Looking forward to it. All right, folks. So we started this week off talking with Kristen Clark, the Lawrence Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. She's the president and executive director about uh, the HBCU lawsuit that has been going on now for 13 years in Maryland. Governor Larry Hogan uh, has proposed a $200 million settlement. That would be $200 million over 10 years to the four HBCUs in Maryland. That's, of course, Morgan State, Bowie State, Coppin State, University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Now, the Baltimore Sun called that offer, frankly, a disgrace. Mm -hmm. They blasted it. Uh, the Congressional, excuse me, the Legislative Black Caucus in Maryland also disagrees vehemently uh, with that as well. They say that simply is not enough. So last night, last night, of course, we were talking about it all week. I had Christian on Tom Jordan Morning Show. We've been discussing on this show as well. Uh, and so last night, of course, we broadcast from uh, the uh, Capital Region National Minority Supply Development Council, okay? Or the Capital Region Minority Supply Development Council. They had their uh, Leaders and Legends Gala presented the award to uh, Marilyn Mosby last night. And yet, before I spoke, before I spoke, uh, I mentioned from the podium the uh, situation in Maryland, and I called on the people. And we're talking about, folks, the top 100 MBEs mm -hmm. in this region who were there last night, more than 1,000 people. And I called on them uh, to demand that, that the governor, demand that Governor Larry Hogan uh, do more. Now, the HBCUs, what they have said is uh, they will accept uh, $577 million. During the trial, an expert said that because of what Maryland did, the number really is around $2.3 billion. Mm -hmm. Others said it's about a billion. So the school said, you know what, sell this lawsuit, we'll accept $577 million. Hogan, in turn, offered $200 million. First of all, he initially offered $100 million. Then he goes up to $200 million. And then he sends a letter to the Black Caucus saying, with a red line saying, final offer. Well, he's been criticized uh, all week for that. So we were uh, at the event last night, as I said. And so one of the folks who also got honored was the lieutenant governor of Maryland, that is Boyd Rutherford. Mm -hmm. So this is quite interesting, y'all. So uh, he goes up, he gets honored, and I'm in the green room. Uh, this is a photo of him. So I'm in the green room, and he comes uh, through the area. I walk out, shake my hand. He goes, um, you know, you really don't know what you're talking about on this Maryland case. I said, oh, really? I don't. <laughs> I said, I've only been covering this case for the last eight years. Yeah, you know what you're talking about. You know what you're talking about. Uh, have, have, have you read the judge's ruling? I said, you do know that I've had the lead lawyers on the show numerous times explaining the case. Also on this show, I had the Republican attorney general candidate huh? who was running, who talked about the case. After he came on, the current Democrat attorney general in Maryland came on the show and we talked about the case. But you know what you're talking about? I said, oh, really? I said, well, you're more than welcome to come on my, no, 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 I'm coming on your show. I said, you're more than welcome to come on Tom Jonah on my show to discuss this. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, uh, we can sit down and talk about it. Uh, I'm not coming on your show. So then his security guard steps in 
And I was kind of like, bro, call. I was like, I need you to back up. I said, the guy's giving me his card. So his aide gave me his card. And I said, oh, we can talk about it. But he kept saying, read the judge's ruling. You're wrong. Read the judge's ruling. I thought that was pretty funny. Uh, and it was a 60-page ruling. Read it. I was like, no problem. Here we go to my iPad. <laughs> so this, is, this y'all, is the actually is a 70-page ruling. This is the 70-page ruling. Uh, the Coalition for Equity and Excellence in Maryland Higher Education versus Maryland Higher Education Commission. It lays out everything. The introduction, the procedural history, proposed remedy, all of these things in here. Now, here's what you need to understand about this decision, and that is uh, the judge ruled in this case that Maryland did not have an unfair system as to how they funded HBCUs. What the judge did rule, go back to my iPad, is that it says, yet current policies and practices traceable to the du jour system in the form of unnecessary program duplication having segregative effects at the HBIs persist. What the judge ruled is that the duplication programs have actually hurt the HBCUs. Now, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford acted as if I didn't know any of this. So he tells me I need to read it. What he has to understand is, and see, this is what Maryland has done. This is the game they play. And it's not as been under Republicans. Same thing happened when Governor Martin O'Malley was there, okay, when the lawsuit originally started. Maryland wants to hang his hat on the judge rule that we did not improperly fund HBCUs. Do y'all know what the original intent of the lawsuit? <laughs> it was duplication mm. of programs. Oops. So the original intent of the HBCU lawsuit in Maryland is exactly what the judge affirmed in her decision. They don't want you to know that. And so when the lieutenant governor tells me I need to read the judge's ruling, I read it. Here go my iPad. I read it. In the several years since this court found that the plaintiffs, including the Coalition for Equity and Excellence in Maryland Higher Education, had proved the existence of unnecessary program duplication, having segregative effectives at the HBCIs, mediation proved unsuccessful, and a lengthy remedies hearing followed. Unfortunately, see the governor act like I couldn't read. Unfortunately, the state did not engage in a serious effort to propose a remedy prior to the hearing and did not permit the coalition's experts to consult meaningfully with relevant state actors, including the presidents and faculties of the HBIs and of the state's traditionally white institution, TWIs. As more fully explained below, the court is forced to conclude that neither side's proposed remedies are, for different reasons, sufficiently practicable, educationally sound, and likely to achieve the greatest possible reduction in secretive effects to justify ordering their imposition. Instead, the court will order appointment of a special master, and it goes on and on and on. So when Lieutenant Governor gets indignant to say, I need to read the judge's ruling, here it is. This is the judge's ruling. This is it right here. Now, I'm trying to figure out what the hell he was hanging his hat on. Because the judge clearly stated that by Maryland allowing duplication, that meant that the HBCUs had programs that were creative, that were attracting white students and other students. Mm -hmm. Then, when the traditionally white schools in Maryland mm -hmm. saw that, created the exact same programs... And anybody knows successful students and numbers follow and money follows. So what happened? When Morgan State created a computer program, Towson State saw it, y'all, it's in the ruling. You had about 120 or some odd students who were at Morgan, about 20 at Towson. They created the program, it flipped. Mm -hmm. Towson had more than 120 and it dropped down less than 30 at Morgan. Because guess what? Students are going to go where the resources are. Uh -huh. yep. Students are going to go where the resources are because that's where 
faculty is. That's where better facilities are. And so what the HBCUs are saying, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford, Governor Larry Hogan, is that in order for us to create these programs, you got to get rid of duplication, and we need the additional funding to be able to build these programs up. Hogan wants to give $200 million over 10 years for HBCUs, which means that's an average of $5 million per HBCU per year. Now, Hogan also wants to hang his hat on by saying, uh, in the last five years, uh, our budget has provided $1.15 billion to HBCUs, the most ever. That's your damn job. You don't get a pat on the back because you do what you're supposed to do. The problem is the state doesn't want to settle. So, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford, what exactly is your point telling me to read this judge's ruling? So, when the show's over, I'm going to send an email to his aide, the brother who handed me the card, and I'm going to say, decision read. Now, when do you want to talk? Because it hasn't changed anything. Look at my panel. I want to bring in Eugene Craig here. Eugene, <laughs> what is laughable here is that, again, Maryland wants to say, the judge made it clear that there was no unfair funding practices. Yeah. Now, boo, I need you to focus on mm -hmm. what the judge did say, mm -hmm. okay? So that, that issue has been that there's no unfair how, this, how HBC, HBCUs are funded in Maryland yeah. compared to TWIs. But Maryland won't deal with the duplication of programs mm -hmm. and the remedy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. It is a problem. Uh, all, and all four HBCUs are hurt. Um, you know, you use the example of the... Uh, computer science program at, uh, at Morgan and Towson. I mean, you know, Coppin and Bowie both have nursing programs, and you've seen nursing programs pop up at Towson and other uh, 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 PWIs, uh, you know, engineering program between uh, Morgan and uh, Maryland. Uh, and so it, it's an issue. Um, I think, you know, Lieutenant Governor Rutherford should come on the show and should address this to a black audience. Um, that's my stance, I say, as a former vice chair of the Maryland Republican Party. Uh, that was elected after Larry and Boyd were elected. Um, I think, you know, both Larry and Boyd served in the Ehrlich administration. They should probably take a, a page out of former Lieutenant Governor Steele's book. Um, you know, when Michael Steele was Lieutenant Governor, he made it, uh, he made it an issue. He made it a priority to make sure that the HBCUs in Maryland got the resources they need, and that was including specialized program funding. Um, a lot of the buildings you see at, at Bowie right now, I went to Bowie State, you know, the CLT building and the business building were both granted, were both you know, funded under the Ehrlich administration. And so, you know, you know, Boyd, you know, needs to somewhat get off his high horse. Um, he needs to come talk to his black audience, talk to Joyner, and talk to any other black audience that wants, that wants answers on this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, look, you know, if, and this, this is my position, if the state doesn't want to settle, okay, then I think the special master to come in and, and, and mandate the state fully fund this at the $1.2, $1.3 billion is actually going to take to really close that gap. Mm -hmm. It, it, it was laughable, Dr. Dr. Carter, mm -hmm. to, to watch Lieutenant Governor's reaction last night, telling me I know what I was talking about. And I'm sitting here going, uh, dude, you lost. Well, we can like, also... you lost. And we can also count. And I think that $200 million figure is such an insult. I mean, that is... You can't do anything on anybody's university campus yeah. with $5 million. I mean, where uh, is uh, that? Can I, can I give you sure. a, a, a little alley-oop here? Just put things in proper perspective, right? In my last year at Bowie State University, the, uh, the state funded Bowie State at roughly about $35, $40 million. You know, that was about, about a third of the budget for Bowie or whatever. You add $5 million to that, that's, not, that's, a, that's a drop in the bucket. That's not even a building. Yeah. That's not even a rehab on a dorm. And I think what's more uh, problematic about this, it's not just Maryland. It's North Carolina. It's Alabama. It's Mississippi. It's Texas. It's all these state... These state um, where they are happy to have HBCUs do more with less and we make things and everybody else gets to take things and get the credit. And what the other underlying part of this is, these PWIs, what people are going is to the prestige as well, right? Yep. So it's not just that people are going over to Towson because Towson has the facilities and the faculty. Towson is also believed to have the prestige and all these things that a Morgan State and a Bowie State don't have and they don't have it because the state has systematically underfunded these schools for decades. But, but, but again, the key here is that the key here is that the judge ruled that it wasn't underfunded, but the duplication of programs serves the exact same purpose. And what, what is amazing to me is to watch this governor. And let me be real clear. See, all the people out there saying, yeah, but it was a, Republic, it was a Democrat before, uh, mm -hmm. before Hogan. Right. Yeah, and we cover the story then, too. Right. Mm -hmm.
The reality, though, it doesn't matter if it's Democrat. I'm calling out the Maryland legislature. Yeah. Because here's the deal. Here's what's going to happen here. If they don't come to a settlement this week or next week, this goes back to the Court of Appeals, and they actually will render a decision. They've been trying to mediate this whole thing. The reason that's important is because you mentioned North Carolina. Mm -hmm. North Carolina is covered under this Court of Appeals. So whatever decision is rendered by this Court of Appeals has the, impact, the effect and the impact on these other states. North Carolina has 10 HBCUs, the most in the country. And so this ruling has a, a potential impact on those universities. And that's what people don't quite understand. And so your thoughts on this? Uh, so, so back to what you said in regards to the ruling, the quote unquote, the state, uh, correct me if I'm saying it wrong but, properly, but the state failed to support Right, the, the, to get the support to the program. So I, I think... No, 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 no. They, they, they supported it. What happened was the state allowed mm -hmm. the predominantly white institutions oh, okay, right. to, to create the, the, same the same program that was created first. Yep. See, this is the right. difference. The HBCUs came up, innovated, created these programs mm -hmm. that began to attract students. White schools like, oh, Essentially, they pulled an Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. yeah, right, right. Uh, oh, we gonna steal what y'all did. Yeah, absolutely. And created the same thing at their schools. And so the white students were like, well, yo, if I got a decision between going to Morgan State and University of Maryland, I'm going to, I'm going to, to the University of Maryland. Right. Because when you talk about the Maryland Higher Education Coordinating Board, mm -hmm. same as in Texas, you want people going to schools based upon the majors. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what, what the judge said is that Maryland allowed this segregation to go on because they threw more, so much money into the, into the program at the probably white institutions. Same program at the black school, but not, not the same amount of money. And, but her, what she's saying is the duplication of programs yeah. is what created the segregation. Absolutely. And that's what the schools are saying you got to ante up the money for because you allowed those schools to grow and prosper with duplicate programs. No, I agree. And then to your point, $5 million is a joke. I think uh, they definitely, it's, it's not, a party aside, I think it's definitely important that we are obviously disproportionate and have obviously less resources. I think it's important to get that money and then so we can have the resources to do what we have to do. Um, I think $10 million, I think $25 million, $50 million is a joke. But it's not it's not fair to allow uh, other schools outside of HBCUs to have the resources to be able to prosper and succeed. Meanwhile, our schools are basically left to the wayside and say, oh, well, we don't have to tell you this worked successfully over here. So essentially, what you're doing is saying, "Well, we'll just take it from there to there." That's not right. You can't take away. You, you can't take away their platform. Folks, uh, the folks at ColorChange.org. Go to my iPad, please. You'll see this is the petition that they have put together. Tell Governor Hogan to pay HBCUs what they are owed. You can sign this petition, folks. Uh, that will also be forwarded to them. Uh, in addition, what we want you to do uh, is to also pick that phone up uh, and during working hours on. Uh, Monday, we want you to call and let the governor know that you want to see a real settlement uh, take place. The number is 410-976, right there on the screen, right here, 410-974-3901, 410-974-3901. I also, uh, let me do this here, I also, last night, again, I was, um, I had a, I was talking with uh, Daryl Barnes, who heads up the uh, Maryland Legislative Black Caucus, uh, and he uh, had this message uh, that he uh, wanted to share uh, with folks. And this is important because, again, I keep telling folks they need our support. I've been pushing the Divine Nine, NAACP, Urban League, Red Instructors National Action Network, because there should be a mass rally. There should be mass mobilization, putting external public pressure on Maryland and this governor to do what's right. And so last night, at last night's award ceremony, uh, this is the head of the Black Caucus in Maryland, uh, Delegate Barnes, this is what he had to say. All right, folks, I'm here at the National Mon Capital Region, National Minority Spot Development Council, but here with Daryl Barnes. Barnes, of course, heads up the Maryland Black Caucus. I was telling you about the group I text, what do you need from them? I need support, I need, I need, this is an opportunity to rally the troops to bring everyone together as we fight this injustice right here in the state of Maryland, where the, where the governor has offered us $200 million to settle a, a decade-old uh, lawsuit. Uh, it's been over 13 years. Uh, the state has said that this lawsuit should be settled around a, mil a billion dollars. The plaintiffs have come back and said, we'll settle for $577 million. 
the governor sent me a letter and redlined it and said, take this $200 million or leave it. That's unacceptable. Uh, and I believe that we can do more. I believe that we need more help. The legislators are doing what we can on the inside, but I need your help on the outside so we make a statement to let the governor know that we're not taking that. All right, folks, we're going to make it happen. Um, again, this is where public protest has to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the thing is, it shouldn't be the case that we are always begging for the scraps and we're always waiting till it gets to this point. Like I said, this is a, a decade-long case at this point. We know people who graduated from these schools, but they can't be the only people advocating for these schools. Right. We all have an interest because, really, HBCUs are the economic engines in these states and in the places where they're located. They're producing doctors, lawyers, judges. They produce more of those folks in STEM than any of their uh, PWI competitors. So so HBCUs actually have a real value here, and we have to make other people see that value. All right, folks, going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Diane Carroll, legendary actress passing away today at the age of 84. This is Rolla Martin Unfiltered. You want to support Roller March Unfiltered? Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real as Roller Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roller Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to rollermartinunfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. rollermartinunfiltered.com. All right, folks, today we, uh, of course, uh, got some bad news. Diane Carroll, one of our most iconic actresses, passed away today in Los Angeles at the age of 84. Her daughter said she had been suffering from breast cancer uh, for the last several years. Her starring role in the television program, Julia, was the first time that little black girls, black boys, could see, frankly, uh, somebody an African-American in a non-servant role on television. Younger TV fans remember her best as the conniving Dominique Devereaux on the nighttime soap Dynasty in the mid-1980s. But in 1962, she became the first African-American woman to win a Tony for her performance on Broadway in No Strings. Here is her acceptance speech. The winners are Anna Maria Alberghetti of Carnival and Diane Carroll of No Strings. I wanted this. I'm like Abe Burroughs. I really wanted this. If you think I'm not going to talk about Richard Rogers, you're crazy. I've wanted to be on Broadway for seven and a half years. And he put me there. <sighs> I would like to go on and do other things, but I will never forget because this man knocked on my door he called me and I love him and thank you very much Tributes have poured in all day. Taraji P. Henson tweeted this, R.I.P. Diane Carroll, thank you for paving the way. It was an honor to know you, Queen. Your legacy will live on through us all. Viola Davis, my greatest blessing is that I had the honor to connect with you on a personal level. You shared your humor, your mess, your mistakes, your talent. You were authentic. As a woman and actress of color, that will be your legacy. Ava DuVernay tweeted, Diane Carroll walked this earth for 84 years and broke ground with every footstep. An icon, one of the all-time greats, she blazed trails through dense forests and ele elegantly left diamonds along the path for the rest of us to follow. Extraordinary life. Thank you, Miss Carroll. And this from Debbie Allen. Diane Carroll, you taught us so much. We are stronger, more beautiful, and risk takers because of you. We will forever sing your praises and speak your name. Love, 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 Debbie. 
Of course, Diane Carroll has lived an amazing life that her family and friends can be proud of. And so certainly, uh, job well done, uh, Diane Carroll. I want to go to our uh, panel real quick here. Uh, she, Robert Townsend cast her in the movie The Five Heartbeats, and yep. we had reached out to him uh, and was not aware at all of her passing mm -hmm. and uh, was, was shocked by it. Uh, she battled breast cancer. Uh, last I saw her was when she was actually at the MLK Memorial in 2011. She was part of the program uh, there as well. And uh, the, the, the thing about that I can say, if, if you ever obviously watched her or met her, um, she operated with a certain air. Mm -hmm. And you, when you approached Diane Carroll, uh, you approached her like you're supposed to approach a grown woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how she carried herself, uh, Dr. Carter. Well, I mean, she's absolutely elegant and probably one of the most beautiful women um, we've ever seen. And I really loved her as Marion Gilbert. That was my Diane Carroll. I remember her on Dynasty, um, but it was Marion Gilbert. And I think one of the things that gets lost is how funny she was. I mean, she was incredibly funny, had great comedic timing, and I just wish we would have gotten that Patti LaBelle, Diane Carroll spinoff from Different World, because I think that would actually <laughs> been a real bonus. <laughs> well, yeah, those, those of us who watched... Uh, a different world. I certainly remember uh, all of that. Her yeah. playing uh, Whitley's uh, mother on yeah. that show as well. It's amazing. Well, I'll jump in. The thing is this. Um, you know, I think we can attribute this era that we're living in right now of black girl magic, of uh, black women, you know, really, really coming into their stride in the arts and media to Diane Carroll, you know, to, to the, the walls that she, you know, took a sledgehammer through. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's incumbent upon us to make sure that her legacy doesn't die. A lot of people also remember Claudine, uh, the role she Absolutely. played there as well. And, uh, and but the other thing is that she also played a pivotal role during the Black Freedom Movement. And the thing people, people forget is that uh, a lot of, some African Americans were saying, why wasn't Sidney Poitier doing what Harry Belafonte and Dick Gregory was doing? Dr. King said, look, we, we need y'all doing what you, what you do. And what people don't realize is, although Diane Carroll was not in Selma, she was not in Birmingham, she was hosting a number of fundraisers at her apartment in New York City. So while folks were marching, you had to have somebody who was raising the money that was bailing folks out of jail. Yeah. And, and that was huge in terms of what her, her role in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. Right. No, no I, I think she uh, obviously left a great legacy. And I think, importantly, that we don't talk about on an often daily basis, it's important to have black women role models that are at a prestigious level. Uh, just look at her acceptance speech, her poise, her poise that she had. I think she was absolutely incredible. And I think uh, nothing against our rappers and things like that today, but we just need more women who, black women who set a high standard and a high bar as, as you should be as a black woman. Again, Diane Carroll passes away at the age of 84. Next week, we'll continue to remember her uh, and share uh, more remembrances uh, from black Hollywood. Got to go to a break. We come back. Might as well end this week uh, with, a, with a little funny stuff uh, with my next guest. Uh, she got something to say about life, and we'll break it down with her next. Roller Martin Unfiltered. The people that I talk to, a lot of them are scared. Losing your eyesight can be a very scary experience. My job is to help them start the process of getting the resources they need to live a full and healthy life. I'm Cynthia King, and I'm a senior therapist program assistant for the New Jersey Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired. I've been doing this specific job for 18 years, but I've been in public service for 28 years. When a consumer calls in, I am the first person that they speak with, and I provide them with the information that is needed. I ask the individual, can you kind of tell me, because of your vision loss, what problems are you experiencing? And then a lot of times, that'll usually open it up to say, well, you know what? I used to really enjoy reading, and I'm not able to read my books anymore. Or I used to love to cook, and I can't see the buttons on my stove. Then we can come out and do a home assessment to determine if there are any technical aids or any techniques that we can assist them with so that they can be able to maintain some of their independence. Cynthia is a very caring, loving person. You can hear her on the phone talking to the clients, and you can hear the passion in her voice. She gives her all to you. When I first started, we didn't have the health care that we have now. We didn't have the salary and the income that we have now. When we went through a rough time during the reduction in force, AFSCME ensured that fairness and seniority secured my job. 
Our clients are going through a traumatic change when you lose your vision, losing your independence. But Cindy always seems to find a way to, to, to make them comfortable. Her friendly tone, her demeanor opens the door up for them to say, well, yeah, s send a rehab teacher out here. I want to meet with a mobility instructor. It's because of the way she handles their initial conversation. I've done this job for so long because I love what I do and I love helping others. This job has been so rewarding for me on every aspect in my life and the joy of knowing that I have helped someone to continue on their journey. All right, folks, we certainly want to thank Aspen for being one of our partners here at Roland Martin Unfiltered, and so their support is, has been a huge uh, to make this show possible. It's been a crazy week in politics, and comedians have been having a ball all week. Alicia Cooper, she joins us right now. She's from Maryland. Her dream was to do stand-up comedy. Well, her dream has certainly come true, and she's back to visit her hometown. Welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me back, Roland. Uh, well, know you know, I don't know. Uh, you sure you got your papers? You know, uh, Trump might call ICE. Hey, uh, you know. Hey, I got it in my he, he, he ain't down with brown people. <laughs> no, uh, no, uh, keep mine on me. It's crazy. I mean, it's been a crazy week, hasn't it? I mean, we have, I mean, I've never seen nothing like we got judges hugging convicted murderers. We got, I'm like, come on. They, everybody gets this whole thing of forgiveness mixed up. Nobody's saying not forgive. You know, oh, you're not a Christian if you don't forgive. We saying, how you forgive five minutes later? Like, forgiveness to me <laughs> is earned. You, right, right. You know the process right. Mike Vick had to go through to get white forgiveness? Mm -hmm. You know, it was a loss of a career, jail time. He had to go into all these programs and PETA and all this stuff and then had to go and, and wash dogs. And, I mean, this man had to do everything to get his life back. And he earned forgiveness. So how come we don't ever have any stipulations on earning our forgiveness? Oh, no, that's, that's not how it goes. No. <laughs> that's not how it goes. That's not how it goes. Like, let me process this whole thing first. Like, I'm just supposed to forgive you immediately? When does that happen? Well, speaking of the process, we started the week off with Donald Trump uh, finding out about this uh, call to Ukraine. Right. And then, he, then he called it fake news. Then he came out and said, yeah, I called him. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know if you're going to lie on the beginning, you don't come out and admit it. And then comes out and says, Chad, I want y'all to get involved, too. <laughs> but when that man stood in front of that podium on the campaign trail and said, Russia, if you're listening, <laughs> he should have been cuffed right then and there. <laughs> if there's no consequences for this man, he's not going to stop. I watched the Roy Cohn documentary, and we realized that that's who he patterned his whole life at. They do everything in full view and right out front, so you can't say that it's collusion or con conspiracies. They try to do it that, that way, but he's bad at it. You know, he's bad at it. Like you said, you're gonna lie on Monday and then say something else Tuesday. But Giuliani's the same way. He lying in the same sound bite. That has probably been... I saw one tweet where somebody said, uh, oh, my goodness, we, we're losing our, all that respect we had for Rudy Giuliani as America's mayor. And somebody said... When? Who? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, who are you talking about? <laughs> who are you talking about? That man is plumb crazy. And Donald Trump, you know he crazy. He couldn't even win his own home state. So when your own home state won't vote for you, that's because they know you full of crap. Hillary won Illinois. You know, so I'm like, listen to the people that know this man the best. They know that he's a crook and a criminal. And who voted for him? You can't never get nobody to admit they voted for him, but somebody voted for him, right? What's wrong? You uncomfortable? With Alicia, look at it. What's wrong? <laughs> you sweating? Yeah, you need to be sweating. They ain't gonna let you back in the White House. You okay? You be sweating down there. I think I'm right. That's okay. I heard you groan down here. You all right? <laughs> he over there. We need a defibrillator for him. Clear? Clear? <laughs> They, they've always been nice. He's, 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 he's a nice guy, man. I think... I think the, who, who is? Who's a nice guy? <laughs> I, I think the message... So I've always said this, and, and I really mean it. I've, I've, I've always said this. People... I'm going to choose my words carefully. You never know this can go. Back to the White House? <laughs> <laughs> Damn, the <laughs> They watching! Two, two blocks left. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I'm about to get audited right now for my jokes. <laughs> there, were, there were those uh, around him who remind him that... Sometimes the things that he says on Twitter uh, it can potentially can, you know, rub folks the wrong way. And to focus more on the policy and the good things that he has done and is doing, first step back at HBCU, uh, funny things like that. Does he need uh, a hearing aid? Because he damn sure ain't listening. You know, uh, so I, I try to focus <laughs> on, the, on the positives, you know, uh -oh. that, that he is doing. And, and the, good, the good work that he's working on right now. I mean, uh, he has great people like Jerron Smith there who... Who, who does a phenomenal job, HBCU graduate as well. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal guy who really is passionate about it. But we definitely are living in a, in a challenging time. I mean, I think it's just very divisive, both parties. Um, you got people like AOC and Maxine Waters who... Bruh, really? 
I think really. Awesome really? Vaccine. Really? Hold on. Hold on. You actually brought out both parties bullshit. <laughs> well, well, really? Well, for, 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 for Maxine to say that, I mean, it's one thing for it's one thing for them to say impeachment, but for her to say that he should be jailed in solitary confinement, that, that, that's a bit much. He that's is probably... thug in chief. Well, I mean, Representative Waters has been around for what thirty plus years in the House. She's been longer than that. If you look at California politics, she is not the issue. She's had her own corruption scandal as well. So I mean, she, yeah, I, I, but I she's be... not calling Ukraine and telling them to look into this man's life. Well, and and and, uh, and also, she's not going on record and say, hey, you know, murder teenagers who were now exonerated for crimes. Absolutely. She's also not owning buildings and keeping people in slums, right? Like, she's not discriminating against people in the properties that she yeah, owns. Right. She's not doing any of the things that Donald history has done, Donald Trump has done mm -hmm. over his history. And she's not the president. See, oh, if oh, this oh, was oh, in oh. court, sustained. <laughs> At least should be sustained. Because sometimes you just can't defend people, even if you, even if you like them as people, right. even if he's your party. It's right. just not defensible. No. It's not even worth it. Well, no. well, but, but, but I generally... I generally you're right, you can't defend everything. But, but I generally... No, my, my, my this is not. Well, correct, but I generally, based off of my relationship and what I do know, I mean, uh, overall, I mean, I, I say what Somebody I mean... Somebody loved Hitler, too, I, I, but that I, I, don't I, make I, him I, a good I, person. I, I, right. <laughs> oh, wow. I, 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 I would venture to say we probably know the same thing. And, and, I, and the thing is that there's very little you could defend Donald Trump at this point. Oh, well, uh, I, I mean, I, it's, it's, and I mean very, very minutely. You mean, so. you mean on that issue? Or I, I mean, I mean, hell on any issue. I mean, I mean life. Oh, this, 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 this is a whole other. We running out of time. No, this is no, a whole. No, other, we're not. It's oh, a whole other conversation. We got time for this. No, no, no. Hold on, 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 hold on. Let me help you out. This my shit. Okay, We don't run out of time. I own all this. Right. So, Shell, we can go to nine o'clock. Right. So, you know, we don't know. We out of time. We've done that before. We've done that before. Right. Don't dumb it. <laughs> I mean, don't, don't be trying to look to the clock when the seat getting hot. Right, and we all know the only person he ever hired that was qualified to do their job was Stormy Daniels. So we don't <laughs> hear nothing else about no Donald Trump and his administration. It is horrible, and people need to get up and vote this time. People want to say, oh, your vote doesn't count. It does count if you use it. Right, but, but, but when we focus on a more policy... Right? Uh, for, for, this or... man, all, all throughout the whole um, campaign trail, he didn't have one policy. What policy did but, he but, have during right, the campaign? But, but let's talk about... Hate but, them! But let's, but let's talk about... <laughs> right. but, let, but, but let's talk about what he... Uh, 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 the ironic the part... Is this, the ironic part... This is why they're actually this, having a, a summit right now at the White House on, on black issues while we're talking at this very moment. So... Say what? Who's the black people there? Who? Say. Who? With Candace them? <laughs> who's that? Boy, bye. Boy, bye. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, Boy, I'm, bye. She's gone. I, I will yeah. say this. Yeah, she, there was actually... It, 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 it pains me to say this, but probably a few times there was some kind of actually policy discussions <laughs> with Alfred Rosa was there. there. <laughs> All right, we need to get her back. Well, no, 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 we don't. Let no. that woman be. Yeah. She finally got her yeah, back got... a little bit, I think. <laughs> I think she finally got her but, 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 no, really, but I, even, like, the first step back, I, I think... Uh, the thing no, with the it, first step back is that you have folk like Rand Paul, you have folk like Cedric Richmond, you have folk like Maxine Waters that were working on that well before Donald Trump ended the scene. Just because he put a signature on it doesn't no, mean but he it gets it to definitely clean was, I mean, Jerron... I, I give Jerron 100% credit on that. When he when he was back on the Hill before he joined the White House, mm -hmm. you know, he was one of the architects of that deal, among, you know, among he, other he deals. He was a generous right. opportunity before he came to the White House, right? And, and, and I worked with him personally on criminal justice reform. I mean, but look, the, the reality is that he, is, he definitely is doing all he can do. He's doing, he's, he is doing a substantial uh, but, amount of... But, 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 but the least, thing is this, that the, I'm going one more point, but the thing is this, right? Jerron's a brother. That's a big brother to me, all right? But if we're gonna, if, if, and I think one day Roland probably should facilitate this conversation. We're gonna have a real conversation about the Trump White House. Right. There needs to be a conversation why there are no black senior staffers in the Trump White House. Right. Well, well, well first of all, and I'm with, I'm with you on that, but first of all, you have to get people that want to be there. You do. So, so, and I, I can rattle off, now, 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 let me tell you something. I can rattle off a list of probably 50 people right now that would Alicia, go into the Alicia, here's West what Bank. I think is funny. Here's what I think is funny. Here's okay. what I think is real okay. funny here. Okay. This is sort of like, to be a black conservative and try to defend Trump, it's sort of like that dude. Who, who don't see his kid all year. <laughs> <laughs> ain't bought no gift, ain't paid child support, but he come in with a damn Hot Wheel and then say, you ain't gonna give me a hug. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do one damn thing <laughs> and then somehow go, show me some love. <laughs> Hell no! Exactly, exactly. You, you nailed it. That is, that is the administration, but y'all got a hard job. Every time you start talking, this man get parked. He got to listen <laughs> This is a stressful situation. Let me ask you a question. We, we, we talk about this all the time, different people. Uh, honestly, I want to ask you an honest question. <laughs> Look, he was here right go for the water. <laughs>
What what would it take? Yeah, this is a different type of audience. Let me tell you, Fox is doing. We have a lot of fun. But anyways, so so what would it take? Fox will challenge you. That's another story. Ooh, no, they, they won't challenge you. That's why they don't call me. <laughs> but, oh hell no, Fox. I, Fox ain't gonna call me. They call everybody who come on my show but me. <laughs> oh, they got my number and the email. They like, nah, we ain't calling that Negro. They say, him different. <laughs> him different. <laughs> what, what, you said, what would it take? Yeah, no, seriously. Like, so, if you were in front of the President Trump right now, mm -hmm. and he said, look, he said, I understand your frustration, but frustrations aside, what would it take at this point? What would you like to see happen? If he said, if he literally actually said, give me five things or whatever, one thing that you'd like to you have. I'll give you one. Resign. Boom. Quit. Oh, man. <laughs> Okay, well, one thing I would like him to be more of a unifier. It's too much division coming from 16. Next. Okay, go number two. Number that ain't gonna two. happen. Okay, that's not gonna happen. Number two, I would need them to stop making excuses for stuff. Like, for instance, minimum wage. They want to say, oh, minimum wage will bankrupt people. Skip that we one. He ain't gonna minimum, do that. <laughs> minimum wage on a sliding scale. What's number three? He ain't gonna do that. Number three, um, I need him to put some more... African Americans in positions of power. He ain't gonna do that. What's number gone. four? Staff position. What's number four? Uh, number four. Uh... He did appoint. I don't. I, I don't. I heard her name quite, but he did appoint mm -hmm. the first black female general. Um, I can't think of. You, you might. You might know. Attorney I, general. No, no, general. Not, oh, okay. general in the military. First, first, first of all, the president oh, okay. doesn't, doesn't appoint well, generals. Generals actually earn their way up, and then they're actually recommended for the next level by the Pentagon. And then the president, in a ceremonial way, signs off. But he 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 don't appoint the general. Well, I shouldn't, shouldn't say appoint. The, the point is he helped. He put the he pinned the ribbon. Well, well she no, 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 had no. a long career by the time <laughs> she <laughs> made it to general, so she just happened to be the guy in the right. shed. You, the you, you might want to skip that one. Come up with something new. Fourth thing. Uh, yeah. What's your fourth or fifth thing? Why he thinking of something new? Man, I mean, it's just nothing that we could do that would help the situation. He's gonna agree to. You know, I want to give. I want to abolish the electoral college. He's not going to agree to that because it benefits him. So there's so many things that uh, won't won't get passed. You know, I mean, everything is stacked in his favor. He's stacked but is it, okay. Supreme Court. He's stacking. Let's start. But, but I gotta ask you. Hold on. Hold on. Wait. 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 Hold on. He's with so it. he's so ignorant. Is it hard for a comedian to get jokes, or is this just like? Oh, it's a too. It's field? easy. It's easy to get jokes. But look at SNL. The stuff writes itself. Yeah. You know, no, it's very easy to do jokes in this 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 climate on Donald Trump. It's actually a little too easy. You think he'll yeah. be reelected in 2020? Hell no. Hell no. Hell no. In a scary way? He in a scary win. way? I think so. No, nah, he ain't gonna get reelected. In a scary way. Let me tell you, unless people that did not vote get up off their behinds this time. Let me he, tell you something. He ain't gonna get elected. We are not electing a man who the same color as your tie twice. It ain't gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. If people don't get up off their butts and vote, we're in trouble. I don't think the Democrats have anybody. Or, or I will say this: I think the Democrats have 23, 24 candidates that could just put their name on the ballot and defeat Donald Trump. Right. Never but... again, never again will you see Donald Trump or another Republican win Michigan by 16,000 votes, win Pennsylvania by 40,000 votes, or Wisconsin by 20,000. And votes. Democrats this those, year are ABT. Anybody those margins Trump. you will never see. And again. Have, you, you can put a squirrel up. And there. Have... And honestly, if the Republicans care about their own party, <laughs> they should do everything they can I agree to defeat this man. I mean, because look, the look, soul of their party the is, 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 is on the line. You cannot have a serious discussion about black people and Donald Trump until two things happen. Until there are actual black senior staffers, not named Ben Carson, or, or that, have, that actually have access to what, power wrong? and resources, one. Uh -oh. and two, did you, did and you two, actually say, what's wrong with Carson? And two, and two, and two. <laughs> is he awake? And, and two, if the Trump campaign is serious about engaging black voters, right. if they're raising $125 million in coordination with the RNC quarter in, quarter out, right. and I, I know for a fact that the convention is already fully funded and all their programs are fully funded, there's no excuse that there is an ample black and Hispanic staff. There's no excuse that there is an ample resources for black and Hispanic field, field staff. Yes. And there's no excuse that there is an ample resources for black vendors to do yeah, business under with this the man's RNC administration, the, the clock so, has been rolled back on black progress. Mm -hmm. You know, there's fewer black I cabinet mean, members in the last few decades now. I mean, he's taking a page out of the you Nixon know. book, right? We give yes. up on blacks in yes. a way, so yes. we're just going to move on. Right? Yes. And, we, and he's not the only one, no. in fairness. But I do think this man is a grifter, this man is a thief, 
He does not care about being a Republican in so much as taking take a sip of that water. So yeah. I just don't to... even know why Republicans want him. Right. I get you want to win, but doubling down on this man yeah. is horrifying to me. But think about how funny it is how we used to complain about uh, McCain and Romney possibly winning. <laughs> I mean, we used to complain about Bush, right and now. I'm saying Bush looks amazing Look, right Bush now. Looks great right but, now. Doc, Liz, I got to ask you the last question here. There's <laughs> no group that hates Republicans more than black women. Mm. I'm talking about... With good it reason. Ain't, it ain't even close. Right. Black women That's just... And, no, the Republicans told me that. I was in a meeting with Rice Previous, and the sister Tar was like, don't know <laughs> black women don't like <laughs> us at no. all. No. Why? No, because uh, black women have a, a ability to see through BS. We cut straight through it. I remember I had a boss. I was a, uh, When I was in college, I was working at NIH in the evenings, and my boss said, I was like 20 years old, she said, you black people have a very good uh, sense of BS. You guys don't... You see straight through everything. And at the time, I was too young to realize what she was saying, but then years later, I was like, she is exactly right. <laughs> right. We have this sixth sense. We can smell it a mile away. We can see it. We know it. We don't have time for BS because we already have too much responsibility as it is that we just... We can't afford to have the wrong person get the, get a certain and job. not to mention that their policies right. disproportionately hurt us, right? Disproportionately when you talk about us. access to abortion, yeah. access to birth control, a fair yeah. minimum wage, yeah. a living wage, child care provisions, environment, yeah. Yeah. right? We still talking about you're talking about black women. So, yes, yeah. we got real beef yeah. with Republicans. Yeah. And I actually think there could be some space in there, but there will be no space to have a conversation about black people and Republicans as long as this man is the face of your party yeah. and you all continue to double down on his lying, sleazy, True. filthy, inhumane yeah. policy. This man is, is regularly and routinely in violation of international human rights law. Yeah. Not to say he's the only one, but talk about that border. Ain't gonna happen, Chris. Talk about... <laughs> Chris, talk about, ain't gonna happen. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Chris, you can't convince happen. me. I'm one of those oh, black I, I, women. Yeah. Yeah. Chris, ain't gonna happen. 24. So, 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 Chris, 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 it ain't gonna happen. So, so here's my question. And, and the funny thing is, black women are conservative. But we're not gonna go over that way. So that lets you but know we don't something like racist, is wrong. Right. Right. No, no, so, we, we so. should be we should be with conservatives if the conservatives were not racist, racist and horrible. If Republicans, we I should can't be say an easy group for you we to get. We will see y'all in 2024. <laughs> so, 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 so here's my question. So, so let's say okay, he, he, let's say he's reelected, right? 2020. So how to? And actually, a butt of mine, uh, sure, Michael, we we talked about this uh, mm -hmm. numerous times. Uh, so really, how do we? Uh, as a culture, like, come, come together and say, okay, look, let's say he's reelected, right? Okay, great. So now you have eight years. So how do we say, listen, it is what it is. The, those, those, are, those that are frustrated or whatever don't like him, whatever. How do you say, okay, look, now we have four more years? Okay, first of all... We, we can't just sit back okay, and say, first well... Of, first of all, you ain't got four more years, okay? <laughs> so this is now October 2019. Well, I'm talking about 2020, once he wins the reelection. No, he ain't gonna win. <laughs> so, I mean, so you might want to focus on, you got 13 months. Yeah. So you might want to focus on that. You ain't gonna get four more years. Get ready for another. Uh, but I want to see the antics. No, 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 no. You ain't getting four more years. <laughs> but rolling. No, I there's mean, a lose, massive. I, I want to see the antics. It's gonna be hard to get him out of there. Oh no, no, absolutely. But no, that's no. That, 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 there's, there's a, there's a massive. There's a, that, there's a, there's a massive. There's a massive, um, Goodyear blimp sized can of whoop ass that's about to be opened. And that's why all your Republicans are retiring in the House. Yeah, oh, yeah. that's yeah. that's why they freaking out Six in the members Senate. In Texas alone. alone. Say, bro. Six members in Texas. Say, dog. They like, yo, we out. We we because we look. Those we, terms yeah, look, look. I'm telling you, Alicia. Yeah. Republicans look. Uh, Republicans right now going like. Is that Debo coming? <laughs> they like, is that Debo coming? <laughs> get in the house, get in the house. Debo coming. Get in the house. He better whip all of our asses out of here. <laughs> Can't even see on the porch. Nope. Uh, That's what y'all buy. I'm just trying to let yeah. you know. So I'm just saying, I mean, you know, and get, you know, all, all them white folks in Ohio ain't gonna say you this time. Nope. Ain't gonna work. Alicia, uh, how can folks reach you? Where you performing next? I'm gonna be at Comp Sports Cafe in Bowie tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So you, you can you get where? online. Cough Sports Cafe. What you doing? Watching the game or something? No, I'm doing stand up. It's oh, oh God! I, th I thought you. Oh, I thought you wanted us to meet you there, watch the game, uh, they got some hot wings yeah. or something. No, no, we're doing stand up. This is the first time they're bringing comedy there, oh, and cool. um, it's gonna be myself, Adela Banks, Frankie French, and Freddie Vernell, and a surprise special guest. So we're gonna have a good time tomorrow. Night. All right. Well, good and luck I went with to that. Benjamin Tasker of Middle School. So oh, wow. some of them coming out. All right. Well, how can folks reach you on social media? You can Alicia Cooper too at Instagram. Cool. All right, that's it, folks. Uh, we got to go. First of all, fantastic week. Uh, don't forget, folks. Uh, first of all, tomorrow, I'm going to be in Baltimore. 
Uh, I have to give a speech tomorrow, uh, civil rights taking place tomorrow. Uh, you know what that also means. I'm not going to be in Atlanta for the opening of Tyler okay. Perry's studio. Mm -hmm. but don't worry about that. I'll be there on sa Sunday. Don't worry about it. I'll be there on <laughs> Sunday. Uh, and so, again, uh, civil rights gala tomorrow night in Baltimore. I'll be giving the keynote speech there. Trump probably going to come up. Uh, and, again, I I'll be uh, at Tyler Perry's opening with studios this weekend. Uh, they have the gospel uh, event, gospel brunch taking place on Sunday, so I'll be there. Looking forward to that. Folks, don't forget, if you want to support what we do, look, we, we the blackest show out here. Uh, and, uh, and again, hey, barely Lieutenant Governor Rutherford, come on, hang out with the brothers and the sisters. <laughs> we can have an HBCU conversation right here. More than welcome. More than welcome to have a conversation. Trust me. It ain't going to be that bad. <laughs> okay, folks, support Roller Martin Unfiltered. Join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar you give goes to support this show. You can give via Square, Register, uh, PayPal, uh, also, of course, uh, Cash App. All of that, uh, go to RollerMartinUnfiltered.com. Every week we end, of course, uh, showing you all of the people who actually uh, donors to our club. Uh, if you see your name, uh, just give me, send us an email. If you don't see your name, but you've already paid, you know we're going to check to see if you paid. <laughs> Uh, send us an email and we'll actually add you to it. Don't forget you also get discounts by joining our Bring the Funk Fan Club for products that are on rollingsmartin.com. All right, y'all, I got to go. Chris got to take some drink some more water because <laughs> it's rough being a Trump-loving black Republican. Holla!